morning, everybody in the US. Good afternoon, people in uh, Europe, not just the UK. And also good evening to people I know dialing in from Asia who are joining us for uh, our very first HFS Live today, which is a unsponsored, unfiltered, candid conversation between myself and some of my friends and colleagues across the industry. We'll be hopefully doing one of these every month. And it'll be a chance as well for you guys to all um, maybe take part as well, ask some questions. We'll give you some instructions in a minute on how how to do that. Um, I'll get my colleagues as well to introduce themselves uh, very shortly. Um, if you want to ask a question, uh, there's a little Q&A box you can see in the top of your screen. You can type in your questions there and um, yeah, we'll try and get to as many as we can on the course of today's conversation as well at the end and we'll also maybe get to some offline if you can it's great so i was also heard that our final panelists managed to just make it on today so i can now get some introductions going so uh very quickly uh, name rank serial number uh, mary lassity Mary's on mute. Yeah, we're just going to do some intro. So, Mary, are you on mute right now? Or oh, sorry about that. There we go. Well, well, Phil. First, I just wanted to say thank you for giving us an opportunity to share what's going on and across different industries and sectors. I think this is very valuable. And um, as my quick introduction, I'm Mary Lassity, Walton Professor of Information Systems and Director of the Blockchain Center of Excellence at the Walton College of Business at the University of Arkansas. Excellent. Welcome, Mary. Great to have you back. Let's moving along here. Cliff Justice, KPMG. Morning, Cliff. Good morning, Phil, and uh, thanks for pulling this together. Um, this is uh, uh, challenging times for everybody, but I uh, really uh, think that this is a, a, a good way to kind of get everybody together and have a discussion on the events at hand. Um, you know, as you know, I, I lead KPMG's investments in um, emerging technology, artificial intelligence, automation, um, uh, cloud, blockchain uh, in the U.S. And, uh, and I lead our global efforts around um, intelligent automation. So, um, you know, a, a, a lot is changing in that, uh, in that area with the priorities uh, uh, refocusing on, on uh, the immediate term COVID issues as well as the, the planning for the recovery um, on the back side of this. So um, really pleased to be part of the conversation and uh, thanks for hosting, Phil. Thank you, Cliff. Yeah, great to have you back as well, Jesus Montas. How are you doing, Jesus? I'm doing good now that I figure, uh, you know, I guess I anticipated a couple of weeks ago uh, to leave New York and I'm sitting here in Austin, Texas, where there's a lot less people. Um, I don't think I would be able to do it today because Texas declared a mandatory quarantine for anybody flying in from uh, New York. So <clears throat> it's interesting to see how the narrative changes from, you know, <laughs> what borders should be or shouldn't be to now like everywhere there are borders here in cities. But, um, uh, I'm uh, Jesus Manta, so I lead uh, globally the strategy offerings, platforms, and thought leaderships for IBM uh, Global Business Services, and delighted to be uh, here with you and uh, with everybody else in the panel. Excellent. Thanks, Jesus. And good choice, Austin. Good place to be. So there are worse today. We're all fates, right? Um, moving along, um, Chayton. Chayton Doobie, good to have you on, Chayton. It's been a while, so um, be to, looking forward to hearing your views today. Thank you, Phil. And uh, I do like your new fashion statement with the face mask. Um, Chetan Dubey, the CEO of IPSoft in the business of building uh, digital workers to augment human workforce. Great. Thanks, Chetan. And I've got a, a new guest today who has been at a, speaking at one of our HFS summits a couple of years ago, but one of my favorite bloggers and thinkers and writers in the, in the, in really sort of the tech and tech space is Azim 
Ajar, who's also been doing some excellent commentary on the, the impacts of COVID for a while now. So I thought it would be great if we could get Azim to join us. So welcome, Azim. Good, good afternoon to you in the UK. How are you doing? I'm, I'm very well, Phil. Thank you. And thank you so much for the, the invitation. I was the late guest because my Mac decided to upgrade its software just uh, 15 minutes before I was due to go online and I couldn't do anything about it. But as, as Phil said, uh, I'm here now. Uh, I'm a, an analyst and an investor uh, independently aligned really to my, my blog and podcast, which is Exponential View. And previously I was a tech entrepreneur, uh, sold my last company about five years ago. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Azeem. Uh, another well-known well known character in, in the industry who's um, now actually running his first kind of startup operation. So I thought it'd be great to have Lee back um, to share his even more candid views with us today. So good morning, Lee. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Yes, in my new role, I do have a bit more freedom to express my views. Um, uh, Lee Coulter, uh, founder and CEO of uh, Transform AI uh, and uh, chair of the IEEE Working Group on Standards for Intelligent Automation and a few other things. And um, uh, happy to be uh, on the panel with these illustrious guests. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Lee. And then, uh, Sandy, we've managed to, uh, I don't know, promote or demote you from Chief Digital Officer to Chief Data Officer today. <laughs> Um, but I was so pleased that you could make it make it back here. I know you've been very much appreciated on, on some of our shows. So thank you for coming, Sandy. Um, uh, and hopefully you can uh, share a lot of what you're seeing going on right now. Thank you, Phil. And I wish uh, all the 304 participants so far the best of health first uh, for you and your families, wherever you are, be safe. Um, interesting times, uh, obviously a massive crisis on our hands, but also uh, never let a crisis go waste. So lots of opportunities, especially in digital, uh, and great that you could put this together. Uh, so yeah, Chief Digital Officer at Mars, all of you know, IT, analytics, e-commerce, etc. cetera, uh, with me. And these are interesting times to be uh, living in and, and thriving in. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So again, here's your instructions if you want to pop some questions through. Um, we talk a lot about the hyper-connected future state at HFS from AI, integrated automation and smart analytics and how that's enabled by global sourcing, blockchain and digital business models. And it's no more so relevant than it is today with what's really happening. Um, I thought I'd bring this up because we've talked a lot about this hyper-connected enterprise and the fact that over the last 30 years, we've gone from shares you know shared services you know offshoring and the initial wave of outsourcing particularly of it to basic digital around 2010 which was really about satisfying customers needs quickly online it was about being very responsive to the era we're in today where we call this the digital one office which is more about how do you be anticipatory how can you start to second guess almost what your clients are going to do for they know they're going to do it themselves how do you bring your customers and your employees together much more effectively in a, in a unified model uh, centered around common outcomes. Um, so we get to the change where real change must happen, which is what we've been talking about for a long time um, in 2020, 2020 plus, when we look at this impact of like the super intelligent digital workers, more autonomous, hyper-connected supply chains, even the advents of technologies like quantum computing, which can significantly change the game. But if you look at the reality of the last three decades, what's really only been happening is we've been doing the same things, just a little bit faster, a little bit cheaper. We'd be moving data around a bit more efficiently around the company. But fundamentally, to really make the changes to get into a hyper-connected state, you have to address you know, your core processes, the way you designed your operations to make them more effective so you can actually then change the whole experiences of your customers, employees. So we've talked a lot, particularly in recent years, about the fact that without going through real painful operational change, you're never really going to change um, what you're doing. You're never going to find that next true threshold of value. And maybe what's happening right now is not just a burning platform, but almost like a flaming platform for change. You know, this is, you know, you just mentioned it earlier, never waste a good crisis. I think Winston Churchill coined that. Um, but this is finally some change that's forced upon us in a very unexpected way. I think we all knew at some point there would be some type of economic downturn. 
But after many, many years of growth and prosperity, sometimes companies don't change as much as they perhaps should. And now we're faced with a situation of virtualizing work more rapidly, digitizing processes in a, in a speed that we never fathomed. And suddenly change is being forced upon us. So it's going to be fascinating how things evolve. And I'll just take you to a, a data point that came out of our big joint study we ran with KPMG uh, at the end of last year, where the number one burning issue that was facing uh, enterprise operations leaders was the fact that and they wanted to shift towards digital online virtual experiences really make that move away from the physical face-to-face -face model and that was by far and away the highest ranked um, pressure that was on the operations leads well now here's your opportunity it's actually happening uh, we're being forced to do this at a speed that we never never predicted so as we begin in today's conversation um, i've managed to pull off many of you know we pulled off a big survey this week. We sent it out on Tuesday. It's now Friday. We just got some data in literally this morning. So I was bashing through this quickly just so I could share a few snippets for today's conversation from some of the interim results. We've got 279 enterprises in. And one of the questions we asked was, um, you know, was, was is this going to be bigger or smaller in its impact on markets than the 2008 downturn? Uh, and you can see here, 50% already think it's going to be much bigger. 30% think it's going to be bigger. So um, it's easy in hindsight to look at something and think, okay, this is going to be much more impactful. But maybe I'll start with you, Azim, uh, as, as the newest guest here. Mm -hmm. Would you would you concur with us? Do you think this is going to be a much bigger crisis than we had 12 years ago? Uh, yeah, substantially bigger. I've spoken to um, a number of people in... Uh, the public markets and also a uh, market that I'm much closer to, which is a private funding market, the venture capital uh, arena. Uh, and there is a sense that this is going to be much sharper and deeper for, for a number of reasons. Um, so, uh, you know, what actually happens when our, when our economies uh, stop, a lot of business models are based on the notion of there being, there being flow. Uh, so you uh, quite often you're paying your suppliers uh, on 90 day terms, but you're re receiving money from your customers immediately. And just looking at that one particular dynamic, which is that people may not have the balance sheet if it was based on essentially receiving uh, sales from customers straight away and paying in 90 days, if they don't get any customer sales in the next 60 days, 90 days, which is which is quite quite possible. Um, so I think that there is there are some underlying fundamentals that make this much tougher than uh, than 2008. Uh, the, the second thing that's likely to happen is that um, you know consumers are going to be nervous, and there was some hope that as China started to uh, come back to life again, uh, that would would uh, you know pick everything up. And it is quite helpful that China, China's growth mostly comes from domestic demand. But I think the early data, and I expect that uh, you know, people from global businesses like Sandeep from Mars um, will have better data than I on this, it suggests that the Chinese consumer is being a little bit cautious in how they are starting to spend. Uh, and so I think you have a, a number of different dynamics at play here, none of which uh, suggest a quick rebound, uh, although clearly there are winners. You only have to look at Micron's results yesterday in the memory chips uh, business and anybody who's building cloud infrastructure and teleconferencing, those businesses um, are, are doing well, but they're still only a small part of the economy. Okay, well, I think, I think the question is flipping over to you as well, Sandeep, you know, from your perspective, looking at a global retail consumer situation, uh, do you have a viewpoint on maybe what's happening in China versus the rest of the world and how this is going to impact? Sure. First of all, I mean, you know, if, if there's any industry I'd pick to be in right now, it'd probably be a global private food company. And, and so that's not a bad, bad place to be. But that's just being fortunate, to be honest. Um, so as we look at uh, this crisis, uh, we quickly have established that our first priority, our first, second, third priority, our first 10 priorities is the safety and well-being of our associates, uh, their families, our contractors, our vendors, etc. because this is a family company. 
Um, now, within the crisis, we've found uh, some amazing changes. One is, uh, you spoke about China. China has recovered, but recovered differently, as Azim uh, hinted at. Uh, we early data from all the online portals in terms of what categories are recovering first, what categories are recovering later. For us, obviously, you can imagine pet food is a, is a staple. Uh, everybody wants it. Everybody wants to stockpile it. Um, chocolate is uh, not exactly a staple, but they're micro trends. And this is where uh, our analytics pieces are coming in and becoming more popular than they ever were. So for example, um, chocolate placed next to noodles was never a thing for a retail store. Now it is because when you're driving in for shopping carts, you can swipe both the noodles and the chocolate into your bag. So you really have, uh, you know, something that we never thought of earlier. There are many other micro trends that we are discovering as China recovers that give us a predictive analysis of what might happen when America recovers or the rest of the world recovers. What are the top five SKUs consumers are searching for today? And therefore, are those SKUs in your supply? Can we push our factories to do better on those SKUs? And therefore, can we recover faster as a society? I was speaking to a colleague in a cosmetics company. Now, in general, you'd imagine cosmetics to be down. But guess what? In China, home hair color became a much higher spiked trend in the last four weeks than ever before. And I'm sure it will be in the US as well because we are you know, in front of our Zoom cameras and Teams cameras all the time. Um, Chinese consumers also deal with makeup very, very differently on video conferencing. So there's a trend. So I think the time has come now to drive analytics to the extreme in the enterprise, to look at every micro trend decision-making within the enterprise, even that school of thought, which always used to plan for a month to then prepare a plan for six months to then take a decision over five years is gone. Uh, that decision-making now, believe it or not, after decades of trying to drive agile and scrum has come down to two week scrums, daily stand-up calls. Yes, exactly those terms, but across an enterprise. I'm finding opportunities for automation, analytics, digitization, e-commerce, D2C in the last four weeks, more than I have in the last two years. And so this is a fabulous time to come out winning through the crisis, if at all possible. Okay, fabulous time. So how long is this, how long is this gonna last for? Um, here's, the, here's the next data point I've managed to pull off for today. We've asked, people to share their personal expectation uh, and then what they're currently planning for in this market. Um, so oh. we're looking at um, six to 12 months. People are personally thinking is around what this is going to take, but most companies seem to be planning at two to three months. Um, so is there too much short term thinking going on here uh, versus what's really going to happen? Or are people just trying to get through the day here? Cliff, Cliff Justice, any thoughts on this? Yeah, um, this is a this is a very very complex question. This is this is uh, the the impact of this. I, I I don't see any real argument that this is not going to be a um, lifelong impact. Um, the world that we uh, have coming out on the back of this is going to be a very very different world. Um, now, you could argue that the um, urgent reactions might fall into some of these more near-term categories. But um, what we thought would take place over the next five years in terms of change and digitization is likely going to be accelerated um, to you know, the next six to 12 months. So, uh, you, know, the, you know, it's not like um, two to three months from now, we're going to start shaking hands and congregating and in, in in meeting rooms and and doing that. That's just not going to happen. The, the the world is going to be a much more digital world as businesses rebuild. Um, you know, th things things are just going to be uh, going to be much different um, going forward. So, you know, maybe maybe the next six to twelve months, it's going to be um, you know a re a rebuilding for businesses. I think the working capital 
um, discussion is a very valid discussion. Um, that's not what politicians are talking about. I, I, I'm not sure if politicians really understand um, how businesses, the operational side of businesses, how um, you know cash flow works, and the stimulus package is going to help strong companies survive. Um, but companies that are already on the edge are not going to come back. So there's going to be a lot of there's going to be a lot of change um, in that regard, and that'll play out over 24 months, 36 months. Um, you know, we're we're going to have a different way of looking at pandemics going forward. We're going to have a, a different way of looking at um, large groups of people congregating. Um, so it's 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 a very complex question, and I don't think anybody really knows the full the full scope of this, other than the world is going to be very very different. Um, and it's not going to have a, a short-term end to it. Yep, I, I think I'm with you there. And uh, as a consultancy, I'm sure you guys are both inundated with clients wanting help, but they're probably struggling to get you on site to help them, right? How, how are you coping with that? <laughs> well, it's we're, we're like any other business. We have something on the order of 210,000 people that used to go into offices and client sites that are now at home. And, um, you know, they're, um, the, the, the way we're working and engaging with clients is different. So we were already, I, one of the questions that came in is, you know, this, uh, news release that we put out a few months ago about our, you know, a $5 billion investment, um, to accelerate digital transformation. Well, that's just going to accelerate faster. You know, the move to the cloud, um, the move to more virtual technology, that's going to impact the professional services business. It's going to impact healthcare. Impact healthcare. Um, so this, this virtual way of working and offering services, um, it, it will accelerate. It'll accelerate as fast as we can accelerate it um, because that's, that's how our business will, will reemerge, just like it, you know, many other businesses that are in the services sector that uh, if, if it can be done virtually, it will be done virtually. There's still gonna be, uh, after we get through the through this, understand more about how the virus uh, transmits, who's immune, who's not, um, there, there's gonna be you know, relaxation of the, uh, of, the, of the standards and the rules, but, but this is you know, going to accelerate how we as KPMG operate in a more digital way. It's going to accelerate our already uh, aggressive move to the cloud. It's just going to go faster. Um, our clients, you know, we're in a in a professional services world. You know, we're we're integrated so closely with the clients that we serve. Um, you know, those technologies are going to have to integrate uh, faster and and better. Uh, you know, you're not going to be able to you know land a, a partner and eleven staff in a conference room. Um, as you as you have in the past, it's going to be a much more digital interaction and exchange of information. Um, you know, people are going to be, you know, as important, more important than ever. However, automation and 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 these technologies that we've been piloting and testing, we now have a catalyst to accelerate. This is a reason. This is a forcing mechanism uh, to accelerate. These these types of technologies that uh, that you know digitize our services. So we're we're an example of many businesses that are that are going to be going through the same thing in the services sector. Excellent, and, uh, uh, Mary. Um, your view, particularly, you know, you've, you're a noted study of obviously an academic who looks at automation and obviously a lot of blockchain recently as well. Um, from your viewpoint, do you see this as an accelerant or a deterrent for companies to move faster, change faster? What do you, what do you, what is your outlook in terms of timescales and, and how this is going to play out? Okay. Well, th well, thank you very much, Phil. Um, we're first, I'm going to just talk about something from a personal perspective. So I think one of the things that gives me a little bit of inspiration and hope through this whole horrible pandemic is I think our countries have been so focused on this rise of nationalism, shutting our borders, thinking we can solve problems on our own. And this pandemic is just one of the many events that just illustrate we cannot solve things on our own. We got big issues like global warming 
is another big one that we can't solve on our own. And one of the things that I'm encouraged about is technologies like blockchains. They're ideally suited to serve as kind of a tamper-proof receipt of transactions across multiple parties who don't trust each other. So I think we're gonna see an acceleration of blockchain applications that address supply chains. We already have good, about 20 different examples from China that have deployed blockchain applications to deal with the COVID virus, doing things like monitoring quarantined um, individuals, doing things like making sure the donation tracking, um, if you want to donate money, that your money's going where you're saying it's go going to go. So I, we've been working on blockchain ecosystems for about four years. So they're here. The impediment to adoption has always been about governance. It's been about standards. It's been about regulations, but the technology is ready to go. And I think we're going to see a huge acceleration, at least for, from the blockchain perspective. Interesting. And um, I mean, we've done a lot of research in this as well, and we're seeing blockchain being used you know, increasingly for areas around the supply chain, not just with banks, for example, and financial services. And when we look at what's happening with the global supply chain today, and I mean, the seismic change that that's going to go through, do you think that's where blockchain is going to have the biggest role to play? Oh, yes. Yeah, so we're already seeing that in supply chains with things like the IBM Food Trust and Trade Lens. So we're seeing that already. But I, I was interested in your initial points, Phil, because what I'm really seeing in blockchain applications is more the applicability of what we would call sustaining innovations, where you're trying to make all businesses that share the same pain points in an industry solving those. I'm not seeing huge transformational types of applications coming from our traditional enterprises. And that's exactly the lessons that we've learned from Clayton Christensen. Where I'm seeing real innovations, just as Clayton Christensen predicts, is from some of our innovative startups. Yeah, and uh, rest in peace, Clayton. He, uh, yes, I know, he's one, he's one of my academic heroes. Yeah, mine too, that was a real sad discovery when I read that just a few weeks ago, was, but anyway. Um, so getting into some more of this data here, um, you know, in terms of preparedness, what are people doing? Um, what's the, you know, how are people's thinking standing here? I've pulled off some data around what uh, companies are sort of pre preparing for. So laying off staff, um, you've got around 30% are considering it, but the most have not done it and they're not committed to it. Uh, a lot, a slightly larger number have already committed to unpaid leave for staff and some are considering that as well. Um, a lot are starting to liaise directly with governments to, for support, especially with some of the grants and bailout monies that are made available. Um, not a lot of enterprises have been providing extra health care at this point in time. Um, unsurprisingly, most companies have committed to banning travel, in-person meetings, a lot of them are canceling conferences. Staggering working hours is something I'm hearing a lot more about got a lot of friends in Canada, for example, where um, they've a lot of the a lot of the delivery centers there have gone to a 50 day, you know, 50 percent on off shifts for all their staff. Um, a lot of companies have committed to social distancing at work. Obviously, the 50 percent on off staggering enables a lot more of that. And obviously, this big shift uh, working from home is being uh, majorly committed from from the majority of enterprises today. Uh, maybe Jesus Martas, you're in the middle of global delivery for a lot of services for clients. Um, you know, does any of this surprise you or, you know, do you think this is going to change dramatically in the next few weeks? You know, how do you see a lot of this landscape starting to evolve? I think it's evolving differently by industry because obviously, I mean, the, the conditions and the impact of the current situation, in different uh, companies in different industries is, is remarkably different, right? If you're an airline right now, uh, then not only you are considering everything that you probably have here in this list, but uh, basically, you know, any other unprecedented action that anybody can think of. Um, you know, if you're in, uh, you know, in the uh, uh, retail or if you're in uh, food distribution, as we were talking before, you're actually in the other side. You're actually hiring because you have this surge of demand and you need a lot more hands than you have, right? Uh, publicly, Domino's Pizza said they're, 
they need to hire 10,000 people just to deliver more pizzas to people. So I think it's very dependent on the uh, specific industry. Um, I think um, I think the mathematics of the impact uh, have only started to be worked out. And, uh, and I think a lot of people, you know, as, as an industry, um, especially as in, he's been doing this for longer than most of us, we've been talking about what it means to be exponential and the difference between the exponential mathematics and the linear mathematics. And I think suddenly the entire world is getting uh, a lesson on exponential mathematics and, and how staggeringly big some of these numbers and therefore the impacts uh, become. Uh, I expect that uh, as the situation unfolds, I think those, you know, the actions around the people are going to get more precise. I think um, some of them are going to be uh, very hyper-local. Um, uh, as as uh, we were saying before, some of these trends are very specific to each of the areas. So it is going to actually require a level of decision making and a level of granularity of the actions that are taken that is going to be very uncharacteristics of large companies. You know, large companies are used to, um, you have a policy at the top and then you kind of roll it out. And that is, you know, the definition of linear thinking, right? I think the current situation is going to demand um, a lot more precision on what do you do by country? Sometimes what you do by state, what do you do by location? I think you're going to be maybe for loaning some employees in one country and you're going to be hiring employees in another country of the same skills. I think it's going to be very complicated. The mobility across borders is going to be very complicated. So all of these policies are going to have to be put into context of countries or even counties, as in my opening mentioned. Um, I would be restricted right now to actually fly in the United States and probably for the foreseeable future, you know, across uh, across county and, and state lines. Well, that's something that, you know, we couldn't even imagine being a factor on what you do with skills uh, three months ago. Uh, so I think all of these things are going to play out. And I think uh, not only all of this, but many new creative actions um, are going to come into place, both to accommodate the surge of demand for certain skills and then to, accom to accommodate for the excess of demands in a very, you know, micro market you know, perspective is not going to be necessarily a, a global trend, even though obviously, as I said, you do have some of the global trends of, you know, if you're a hotel, if you're an airline, then, you know, it doesn't matter where you go in the world, you actually do have a problem. Thanks, Jesus, for sharing some thoughts around how this is impacting you and your, your uh, work life as well. So um, I agree, this is a, a long drawn out period of change that we're going through. Um, has it changed business decision making? Um, obviously, it's very early days, but it does start to ring home a bit that uh, most people are being tentative. So 36% think that they're going to carry on as usual and appropriate and plan some appropriate contingencies. But I have seen 22% here seeing emerging opportunities arising and they're making appropriate investments. Um, a few are hunkering down and looking at cost savings. So my overall feeling already is that people aren't jumping into a huge panic situation. Obviously, when we go and look at different industries, there will be more distress in areas like hospitality and travel. But in general, there seems to be more of a tentative, we'll wait and see and, and plan. But there is a faction which are already thinking, hey, let's get ahead of this. Let's actually see if we can exploit a crisis to do um, things more effectively. Um, so maybe Chaitan Dubé, you work in you work in an area where you've been pushing some very innovative solutions at the world for for a long time now. Um, do you think this is going to provide you with that kind of flaming platform for change that that you've wanted to see? Well, Phil, um, thanks. Uh, first, I think you're to blame because um, you you started um, with this research on straight to digital. And we find ourselves in the biggest straight to digital experiment of our times. Um, I feel that, um, you know, the, for, for the longest time, the support structure, particularly when it comes to customer care or help desk, the front lines of defense have always been humans. 
and they've always been backed by technologies in the back end. Uh, whether it's an RPA technology or any of those technologies, they've always almost leveraged so-called automation technologies in the back end. <clears throat> but the front lines of defense have always been humans, almost always. We're, we're, we're starting to see an accelerated, complete shift, an antipodal shift, where the front lines of that customer care is now shifting to being digital first, backed by humans as a point of escalation, as a point of governance. You're, um, you're looking at the, the classic, uh, and then you've written about this, so I, uh, I obviously am, beg your forgiveness for preaching to the choir here. Particularly, I know that um, some of the panelists are uh, people I look up to. I mean, Jesus's point about exponential math is spot on. You know, we've been seeing this digital Darwin curve emerge over a period of time, particularly over the last, quite honestly, over the last nine to 12 months, we've been starting to see this. So before 12 months, it was almost always, the digital race was almost always pilots and internal. Let's look at a de-risked environment. Let's look at internal IT help desk. Let's look at an internal service desk and let's go ahead and just transform that. Somewhere about nine to 12 months ago, that switch flipped to external. And that, and then started to emerge BBVA, 9 million customers by our digital technology. Bankia, 2 million of their customers. BNP, their principal securities exchange. And you know, your BT in your neighborhood, um, right from their CEO level. Emerging where companies started to progress from just being informed to being experimentalists and risk internalists, moving up to being looking at fast follower tracks all the way up to becoming a leader, JPMC. Uh, massive amount of transactions, just in credit cards, uh, and clear intention right at the top is to complete leader in that. Uh, and we have personal experience with all of them, and just empirical data. What has happened in this, um, in this period is that that movie has been unfolding, and as an, you look at 45% margin enhancement by moving up to a digital front runner as opposed to a 35 margin compression. And as you see this movie unfold, it has been a process of incrementalism. As slowly these companies have started to, different, at different rates, have started to move up this curve, of the class digital dominance curve. The last three weeks are almost as if somebody passed, somebody uh, pushed the 8x button on that DVR. We're starting the rate where people are moving very rapidly. Australia, I'll give you an example. Department of Home Affairs in Australia. I'm moving slowly. Some have galvanized into um, and, and very fast and impressive pace. And uh, 7,000 hospitals that are actually uh, uh, suddenly uh, looking for innovative solutions for handling COVID crisis. Uh, technologies that are uh, company particularly for where the revenues are. There are some innovative solutions that can actually help these times. So to your point, decision making in this marketplace has gone you have shut it as one of us actually get to an end-to-end automation of the front lines down at digital move very rapidly towards that uh, future of a hyper-connected state where digital agents are connected in a very seamless way to the human agents and continuously learn from the actions that are coming in the back from the 
the human agents. That's what we are seeing in the marketplace. Thanks, Chayden. That's good. We're cutting in and out a bit there, but I think we got the gist of that. So I do appreciate you spending the time to come in. Um, so here's, here's the favorite piece of data I managed to pull off this morning. And I did have a question from the audience on this situation is changing every day. When do we get the data? Well, we put the survey out on Tuesday night. It was filled out Wednesday and Thursday, and we looked at the data this morning. So it is from this week. Uh, so we can assume this is from the situation where we're fully into this crisis. Um, and this is some data we pulled from the enterprise suppliers. So these are the providers and the software firms who filled this out. And we asked them, what are they seeing more from their clients in this current crisis? And none of these respondents have any, any motivation to lie. They're just giving us their honest view on what's happening. Um, and what we can see here, I think we've ringed is in terms of AI, not too much increase, uh, some increase. Um, where we're seeing the biggest activity, unsurprisingly down the bottom, is moving workflow solutions into a remote working environment. So that's been massive. Uh, that's been dominating the worlds of our supply side for the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, but the second biggest area that I really wanted to talk about was restructuring internal operations to survive the per turmoil. Um, you know, that, that seems to me that this is a time where you have to look at your basic workflows, figure out how to run these effectively in a virtual model, and you can make changes very quickly to get these things operational. And these are some changes that companies have just not made for a very long time. And this is now forcing them to address, you know, are we really operating in the right way? Are we getting what our customers want to our employees to service them as quickly as we can? How are we keeping our customers happy during times where, you know, they're just expecting, you know, 99% uptime all the time, despite the fact that we're in a terrible situation. Um, so Lee, uh, last but not least, um, you know, we've also asked some questions around other areas of like automation and things here. But I mean, looking at, you know, the positive and the negatives for, you know, the industry that you've been in, um, do you think this is a truly seismic, seismic change that's going to create opportunities or do you think this is also going to see the wheat separated from the chaff? What do you think is going to happen here? It's a great question, Phil. And this is the, it bears a striking resemblance uh, to the last couple of uh, economic downturns that we've had in that they were laborless recoveries. Uh, they took longer uh, and they they – uh, particularly in the most recent recession, uh, the investment coming out of that in innovation and the chain, the permanent changes to business models, with significant investments in in automation as opposed to just hiring a bunch of people back. Um, this is proving this is this is forcing operating model changes. This is proving that that companies can work differently. Um, it's forcing the adoption of all new ways of working, um, and it's uh, it, it's it's pushing a reliance for for technological connection. I think you know, Chayton was talking about uh, some of that as well. So, uh, absolutely, uh, you know, I, I, I was talking with the, the owner of a large uh, PE group uh, this morning, and. Um, you know, the go-to-market has to be fundamentally rethought when you can't have an in-person meeting, when you can't have a business dinner, when you can't have a roundtable. Um, and clearly, the you know, how do you get a purchase decision? And and if everybody's hesitant to 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 make a purchase, um, where will they be making uh, buys? And and it's going to be in in support of of these areas, restructuring internal operations and. Um, and, and moving into uh, a world of remote work. And I think there are a lot of companies out there that uh, didn't believe that you could actually run the operation in, in a fully remote um, uh, context or, or setting. Um, and you know, I think for those of us that come out of the shared services and BPO world, we know that it's absolutely possible to run, you know, a 10,000 person operation in a fully remote uh, manner um, if you have the right technologies to support it. So I think what we're going to see is 
uh, over the next three to six months, the learnings um, of, of how to operate differently, how to operate with far less expense, I think this will have a lasting impact on corporate real estate, um, and I, I think it will open up new opportunities for um, uh, for technological innovation that allows for uh, virtual teaming and 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 continuing. I, I really, honestly, I believe that a lot of companies that have have made this flip are going to look at their ability to operate effectively and keep a lot of the structures that they're putting in place on a reactionary basis. Uh, obviously, there are still a huge segment of business that is that is dramatically impacted here, and you know, the economic impact of that and the stimulus plan, you know, a lot remains to be seen in terms of how that's going to play out. But I think that we will see uh, uh, the new way of operating become uh, the new way, um, and that remote work is going to become more the norm than ever. Right. And when you say new way of operating more the way, um, does that mean we're finally in a situation where enterprises are going to look at real business continuity? How the hell do we operate in a, in a virtual model? And then you look at whatever technology is going to help us do that, as opposed to we need an AI strategy. Let's try to build around that. Do you think we're finally at that point where the operations come first, the process comes first now? I do. Um, and, and maybe not, not on, a, on a total enterprise basis, but for uh, the majority of the organization that's dedicated to delivery, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think uh, digital labor is going to, um, to have a resurgence. I think there's a lot of uh, uh, folks that are going to be looking for uh, there's going to be so many uh, people in flight uh, that, that got furloughed, that got laid off, that so many gig workers and uh, pretty much any anything that was uh, contingent labor, uh, yeah, that's where companies are going to first in order to, to cut costs. So we're going to have a lot of labor in flight here over the next 12 to 18 months. And, and I think while that's in flight, people are going to be looking to replace that lost labor or, or – uh, use digital labor um, to uh, to fill those spots where where possible. Okay, um, and and maybe uh, uh, Cliff, you've got a lot of experience here as well. But trying to implement complex change remotely, like digital labor strategies, intelligent worker strategies, that sort of thing. Do you think we're going to figure it out how to operate in a more remote model with consultants and experts and software people or do you think it's going to be a big big struggle for many how do you think we're going to get over that that challenge yeah i think we'll figure it out because we have to it's uh this is uh this is the catalyst that drives the type of catalyst that drives change and um there's there's no other option but to figure it out so to me that's a to me that's a simple answer yes we will figure it out and you know, it's it's not going to be 100 percent, but you know, it's it's going to be a very very different mix. Um, our reliance on technology is going to increase. That's that's not in question. Uh, it's just a matter of what kind of tools, what kind of support do we give our employees to manage this type of change? And um, technologies like this um, are going to be important. Um, the uh, the ability to um, interact with voice and video. So, you know, we're, we're, go we're going to figure it out because we have to figure it out. And, um, you know, this is uh, the necessity is the mother of invention. And this is the necessity. So, yeah, yeah that, to me, that's an easy one. Okay. I've, I've had a lot of questions coming in around how this is really changing engaged work lives, our job satisfaction, these types of things. And and uh, I've got a great question around, are we going to adopt, for example, if we're really going to be working at home a lot more, um, is this isolation going to result in engaged, satisfying work lives? Or are we going to adopt a much more hygienic practice of our offices, you know, maybe more bowing to each other than just shaking hands, that sort of thing. Uh, Azim, I'd love your sort of just thoughts on this. Do you think when we start to go back to 
normality? Is it is it are we going to have more people now satisfied with a remote working situation, or will we we'll move back to that kind of office environment, but with very different practices? Uh, depends what you whether you think normality is a static thing or a dynamic thing. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You've got Perfectly. me absolutely. Yeah. So so. Uh, you know, norms change. I think one of the earlier speakers pointed out that this is a, a moment of accelerating pre-existing uh, trends. And so uh, a, a large part of this is uh, the chief innovation officer's um, uh, opportunity to run a load of experiments, whether it's internal operations or uh, kind of core innovation and strategic questions. Um, through those experiments, we'll figure out what sticks. When we look at this question about remote working and uh, around what the office structure is, um, the longer we stay out in this situation of working from home or, or rotating in, the better we will adapt to it and the more we will start to enjoy it. So I think one of the key questions will be, um, how long does this, price, this, this, this st stage last? How well do we end up adapting our, pra our practices, which include also how we interact with our families who are downstairs for many of us, in my case. Um, and, and there is one trend which I think seems to have been hurt very badly. I mean, in general, this has accelerated a lot of the exponential age trends, which is the trend of, of co-working. So anyone who now looks at a co-working space, and there are some very famous companies in this area, um, you know, I look at those now in, in, with new eyes, which is I simply see them as vectors of transmission. Um, and so one question for me will be the extent to which they reinvent themselves um, in order to uh, manage our new considerations. Uh, the one thing that's worth noting, of course, is that in many industries, uh, uh, particularly the, the, the early stage technology industry, the sort of Silicon Valley industry, remote working and asynchronous working, which is another component, uh, has been a part of the developer's art for 20 years through tools like um, version control and IRC, uh, and then you know HipChat after that, and all of the tools built by Atlassian. We forced these tools onto a whole set of other industries and job roles, uh, and it turns out that, that, that actually we can increasingly use them. So my expectation is that, that we will fundamentally shift the way in which large groups of our employees end up working. The depth of that will vary sector by sector. I think, uh, again, Jesus may have been, uh, made the point that the impact here is very sector dependent and the likelihood that these changes will stick will be dependent on how long we stay in this uh, particular situation. If we're only here for a couple of months, then fewer will stick. If we're here for many, many, many months, then many more will stick. Hey, Phil, can I jump in here for a second? Sure. Um, I, I think we should, we should um, separate the ideas of remote work versus work in isolation. So a lot of us can do remote work, but we like to do it from our local Starbucks, or if you spend any time in Silicon Valley, there's lots of garages. I think fundamentally, human beings are social animals. And I don't think we'll ever adopt a, a, a work environment where we're isolated in our homes. Um, somebody, one of your attendees had asked the question about job satisfaction. We actually have a lot of data on people who first started working from home and their job satisfaction went up for just a couple of weeks because it was novel. And then they begged to have some kind of interaction with their, um, with their colleagues and, and wanted to go back to an office at least two or three days a week. So I just think it's important to separate the notions of remote work versus isolated work. I, I think it's absolutely correct. I mean, I founded this company 10 years ago. We were pretty much, we built this company in a remote model for seven years. So you get used to doing fairly complex tasks, working remotely with, I mean, designing marketing brochures without being able to sit next to your marketing person, things like that was really hard. And in the last three years, we've been and a very much office driven environment. So we've gone suddenly back from where we were to something where we were before. And I fully concur with what you said, Mary, it's you've got to get the balance between effective virtual work and having that physical proximity where, where you need it as well. And um, getting that appreciation is, is so important. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, Phil, this is Sandeep. I, I think this is the right time to experiment with this, um, especially for large global organizations. Uh, what we are doing now is beginning experimentations of how to restore normalcy in remote work. And normalcy means it's okay for your kids to scream in the background. It's okay for your pet to bark in the background. That's normal now versus slightly unacceptable earlier. Um, it's okay for us to have panel discussions with, other, for example, this week we had other chief digital officers, chief strategy officers in our sessions um, come in and describe how they're dealing with the crisis in their organizations. And while thousands of uh, Martians listened in and realized, oh, okay, this is normal. In fact, we're probably better off than a few other companies. So, so that restored normalcy, morning yoga sessions on Teams, evening cocktail hours on Teams, things we would never actually do with 1,200 people together. Um, the company's discovering it. Now, again, as Azim said, I don't know if the yoga session will last beyond two months. I think the cocktail sessions will. Um, but either ways, uh, I think now is the time to experiment how to keep the associates engaged for them not to feel guilty if the afternoon is free and they can go take a walk. And that's okay because this is new and this is the new abnormal. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I can't believe how quickly the time has flown uh, on this conversation today. Um, but I wanted to get everybody to finish up with, they've all said one thing will dramatically impact uh, the world from their perspective. Uh, and they anticipate the biggest change. Maybe everyone could just summarize what they think that one big thing is that's going to change the most um, in, how, in how we do things as we move forward. So maybe Sandeep, we can start with you. What's the one thing that you're taking away from this that's going to be the biggest change for us? Uh, definitely analytics. I think this is going to be a remote, data-driven, insight-driven world more than ever before. And so the reliance on analytics um, will be even more than early. Thank you. Um, Jesus, the one big change that you think is going to be hitting us more than ever coming out of this? I think is, um, I think is the concept of trust. It's a concept that was already uh, under attack, right? What information you can trust, what is fake and what is real. That was already a problem and it was, it was, um, it was perceived that it was a problem on the digital realm, but that's why people meet each other. And that's why, you know, you actually eliminate the proxies of trust when you um, go to the physical world. But guess what? Now, you know, everything is going to be more digital. So I think there's going to be this idea of how, for example, how do you do a sales process end to end with no human contact from discovery to exploration to negotiation, to closing a contract, um, how, how can you trust that, you know, that process is going to be done? So I think in my view, that concept was already in evolution. I think it's going to accelerate. What does it mean to trust something or someone uh, when, when a bigger element of the interaction is going to be digital um, is something that is going to be one of the areas to resolve. It's massive. It's a very good point. Very good point. And I think Chayton, you'd be the perfect person after that to, to talk about what you think is the biggest, the biggest change that we're going to see that we're going to need to address. Yeah, thank you, Phil. I completely agree with Jesus. And I apologize for my connectivity in the, from a remote farmhouse. And Mary's concept of work isolation here. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but I, would, I would completely agree that it's going to be a digital first world. As I was trying to say in a chopped up voice, it's, uh, we've been seeing this evolution of digital Darwinistic curve, but the organizations have been incrementally moving up the curve in, uh, from experimentalist to fast followers to being leaders on the curve. And it's been a very, it's been a methodical progression up the curve in everybody's and moving at different rates. This unfortunate crisis has just pressed the 8x button on that DVR. We were watching that movie of going to digital, and now we're watching that movie play out in a very fast forward way. And, and that's, that's gonna be the biggest accelerant. The learning part is going to be key though. 
because we have to make these digital machines have got to become equivalent to what people were getting from the front lines of the customer care by humans. And from that point of view, when we had the front lines of defense become digital, they're going to be backed by humans. And as the humans respond, the front lines of defense for customer care have to be able to learn from what humans are saying. And that's what we are going to see. We are, we are all starting to see that accelerate in the marketplace. In remote airlines, connection air, nobody has heard about them, have just suddenly come over to us and said, listen, we really need to be able to go completely digital in our customer care. So we are seeing this rapidly happen. Yep. My mobile phone provider just did that to me today. <laughs> I'm very scary. sorry yeah. for that. I apologize <laughs> to everybody for sitting in a farmhouse in the Hamptons there. No. no, no, we heard you just fine there, Chase, and that was great. No, I said my mobile phone provider yeah. told me today that their contact center is no yeah. longer taking calls. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Wow. All right. Um, so one big takeaway that's going to change the world from this, uh, Lee Coulter. So the, I think that one of the biggest things here, well, there might be a few, but they're all going to be around uh, the comment that Cliff made, necessity being the mother of invention, and, and then that opening up the door to opportunity. You know, if you look at the world of AR, VR, we're going to see, I think, you know, significant uh, investment in, in making this the quality of, of remote work and the new normal more technologically enabled uh, and and as we, we we find a way to to work um, differently um, we're going to have a whole new set of tools and I think the, the the pace of global collaboration if you look at what happened in just the last um, uh, six to eight weeks in terms of international collaborations globally. Uh, there are three vaccines uh, in clinical trials. There are treatment protocols that were developed. Um, and I, I think actually IBM Watson was used to, uh, to do molecule evaluation um, to narrow down uh, the, the molecules that could be uh, used in, in, in trials for um, developing vaccines. So we're seeing, you know, the pr very practical, urgent use of machine learning. We're seeing, um, and we're, we're feeling it today, the, the frailty of our, of our infrastructure in terms of enabling the new way of work. So uh, I think the new way of work is probably the number one biggest change, and I think that the enablement of that in the next 36 months is going to transform dramatically. Thank you, Lee. So um, from Lee, I think, let's hear from Cliff Justice, um, you know, listening to today's conversation as well. What do you think is the biggest change we're going to have to adapt to? Well, it's going to be, it's going to be a, um, a more remote working environment, uh, a more distant learning environment. Um, it's, it's, these are trends that were already in progress. This is just accelerating it. We will find equilibrium. You know, the, as, I mean, Mary is very right. We, you know, the human, you know, humans are social beings. So we will eventually find a, an equilibrium and eventually hit some kind of stasis around, um, you know, what the right mix is. But this is just accelerating um, the, the digital transformation that was already in play. And I think for the most part that people will view that as positive and more efficient, more effective and we will find the right balance around human interaction and that, uh, you know, that's just as, as health improves, as healthcare improves, if there is a vaccine and, and so forth, things will return to some type, of, some type of normal. It'll just be a different type of normal. Um, there are gonna be some challenges too. There was also a trend around reverse globalization. Um, and I think many people would view that as a, as a negative. And this could also accelerate that. So just be, be aware that, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity. I'm an optimist, and I'm always going to be pointing out the, the good things. But there, there were also some negative trends that were in play, and, um, and we risk accelerating those negative trends as well. Okay. Thank you, Cliff. And uh, Mary Lasterty, um, listening to everybody as well today. You know, what do you think is the biggest change we're going to have to get ahead of now in the next few months? 
Well, I think there's a couple and, and we've kind of touched on many of these. One is definitely rethinking our global supply chains. Mm -hmm. So many of our companies have gotten so efficient. They're down to, you know, just in time, very holding very little inventories. And that works well when you have good predictive models. But um, as Jesus pointed out that, um, you know, in a world where you see so much uncertainty, we're going to have to rethink that. Um, I think things like having additive manufacturing locally can help. I mean, a lot of our tests, for example, for the COVID virus, we're missing a tiny little plastic part, right? Um, you can't wait for China to ship that plastic part. So I think we're going to be rethinking global supply chains. And the other time is, are we finally ready as a world to go to digital currency? Whether that's a fiat token or whether it's a cryptocurrency, that will take a lot of the friction out of our uh, financial systems. Okay, uh, I think I think that's a very important point around the friction and and that shift. Uh, so last but absolutely not least, uh, Azim, it's great to hear your views, great to hear your mm. voice involved today. What what's your one takeaway on the biggest change we're going to have to tackle now? Well, I, I think the biggest change is uh, simply the scale of the change. In the last week, I have been on sessions like this with obviously um, uh, your fantastic community, Phil, but also with uh, a group of. Uh, over 200 chief strategy officers from around the world. Um, I've got one coming up with uh, chief HR officers uh, and investors uh, looking at the startup ecosystem. Every single person is saying uh, there's going to be a significant amount of change more than they've ever seen within their domain. And, and I think we as leaders of companies uh, have a significant role to play that is outside of what's going on in our own organizations. And, and that is that there is an institutional gap for solving these kind of collective action problems. We've seen it with climate change, we're seeing it again with the pandemic. And yet we have talent and capability. We have a set of, uh, a set of responsibilities and duty of care to first and foremost our employees, but also the communities around them and our customers. And that means that while we turn inwards because we have to make sure our organizations succeed and make it through this, we also have a responsibility to turn outwards and form part of the stakeholder group that is going to shape the structure of the world, what I call the settlement after COVID-19. Because I think we as a business community have a lot to add to that, to those discussions, and we could bring some grace and some constructiveness to what would otherwise be a, a little bit of a, a fight between political tribes. I concur greatly with that statement. Thank you very much. And hey, thanks everybody. I really enjoyed the time you've all set aside on a, after a crazy couple of weeks. And uh, I hope our life, lives will return to some semi-normalcy next week. Um, and I really enjoyed hearing all your views and honest opinions on where we're all going. Mary, Cliff, Jesus, Chetan, Azim, Lee, and Sandy, thank you very much for your time. I think we'll make a recording of this available at hfsresearch.com. So that'll be up probably next week. And we'll do this again last Friday of April, probably. So hopefully we can get many of you back. We'll get some other folks on the line as well. But I really enjoy hearing from everybody and making more efforts to communicate virtually uh, using our network as well. So thank you very much. And thanks to the HFS team for put, putting this on. Uh, have a great weekend, everybody. And hopefully we'll have a better week next week.